Tanchi Kiwa. Hello, how are you all? Welcome to Homelands, originally broadcast on CFCR Community Radio, 90.5 FM in Saskatoon, Homelands of the Metis, and Treaty 6 Territory, CFCR.ca. This is your favorite auntie, Andrea Letting Dushni Kashun. My name is Andrea Letting, and call me Auntie Andy if you like, and I'll be your host over this next half hour. I am part settler, part relative, and 100% ally in relation to everyone. I'm just me, I'm not a card carrying member of any indigenous nation, but I am loved, adopted, related to, and accepted by many, hate, rejected by a few, haters gonna hate, relators gonna relate. I am blessed to have indigenous <laughs> relations in my family, and secretly I may love them more than the rest, only because they're the first peoples of this land who welcome all the guests. But I'm also of Irish descent with some Scandinavian, along with a little bit of mystery, and that's the way I was raised. Strongly anti-colonial and justice-oriented with a big related heart for all. I most empathize with my Batash Métis friends and family in that history and culture growing up, and as an adult have continued to try and live that meal permits when that beautiful good life. So from the fringes of the sash, I situate myself as a relative and an ally and welcome you, my listeners, as brothers, sisters, nieces, nephews, cousins in the homeland. So let's welcome our relative tonight. So I'm very excited to, <laughs> to uh, introduce my sister from another mister, my, my <laughs> wonderful friend, Jenny Lassard, and you may know her as Chef Jenny. She is very renowned. Um, she's completely self-trained. I thought she was a red seal chef, and but she's like just as good as one. Um, but she's she's I'm really a red sash chef. Red sash chef. I like that <laughs> even better. <laughs> I'm sorry I laughed during your intro. I love that haters gonna hate, relators gonna relate. I'm gonna just use that in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, as you should. <laughs> it's my motto. Yeah, so, so Chef Jenny is currently living in the Clapel Valley, Treaty 4 Territory, the beautiful um, Lumsden area. And I just love that neck of the woods. Um, I've, I had a beautiful horse ride there once. And oh, I just love it there. Every time we drive through, I just, I just, anyways, it's a beautiful place. And the homeland of the Métis there. But she has lived most of her life in Treaty 6 Territory. And she was raised north of La Ronge, where she had a restaurant, New Ground Cafe. And she raised her kids in Birch Hills. And she moved to Saskatoon to start Chef Jenny Cuisine. She wrapped that up in 2019 when she became the executive chef at Warner's Gaywin, where she was actually the first female and first Métis, first female Métis chef there. And, uh, <laughs> and, and she also did a lot of work there, kind of working on uh, decolonizing and, and as, as she does everywhere, just kind of bringing things back to that Indigenous um, circle and that way of, of relating and working in good relationships. So that's one of the many things I love about her. She's, she's still their culinary consultant and she's involved in creating immersive culinary experiences such as the Han Wee Dinner, which she can tell us more about. Her business is called Inspired by Nature Culinary Consulting. She does recipe and menu development, online content, cooking classes, and you can check it all out at jennylassard.com. So I recommend it. So um, yeah, so Jenny, welcome. <laughs> Hello. I just have to circle back, as we say in these uncertain times. My restaurant was in Birch Hills, New Brown Cafe, and I did have a little rest a little food business very briefly at the age of 14 with two friends, and we started a restaurant at the LaRange Airport called Flight Delight. <laughs> and we served little tiny burgers, which now would be called like artisanal sliders, but back then they were just burgers that shrunk quite a bit in the cooking. And we serve people coming in and out of the scheduled flights uh, um, from the north because the airport's located about four miles from Orange. So that was my first foray into food service and I loved it. And then um, ended up um, with kids quite young, married at the age of 21 and had my daughter just before I turned 22 and worked as a freelance writer and also had did food wherever I could. Every time there was a bake sale or craft sale, I'd take my little espresso machine and my, <laughs> my bannock and my soup and my baking. And my mom and I had a, a table at the Prince Albert Farmer's Market called the Straw Hat Cafe. We wore straw hats and it was in the, the city square in Prince Albert. And I'd bake till about, you know, two or three in the morning, sometimes with my baby on my back and wearing a toque so he wouldn't pull my hair. And then loading the kids up in the food at about 6 a.m. and selling selling my wares there. So that was my training for <laughs> opening a restaurant. And a lot of people say that if you want to make a small fortune in the restaurant industry, you start with a big one. But I didn't know that. I'd never heard that saying. So I thought it would be a good way to make a living. And a little spot came up for rent in a hundred year old building that was kind of our town's catch-all. It was, had a laundromat, Sears Depot, hair salon, pet grooming, 
um, appliance repair and the little 14 seat cafe. So I started that and did just two kinds of soup, bannock, Red River cinnamon buns and cheesecake every day. And then eventually kind of outgrew that space and was able to, with the help of the Clarence Campo Development Fund, um, Affinity Credit Union and um, what was then Aboriginal Business Canada was able to purchase another old building down the street. And then I had a daily chalkboard menu with local ingredients and food and live music. That was a new ground cafe. Did I say that all in one breath? <laughs> <laughs> it was a great breath. It was, it was a nice summary of kind of your journey thus far. And I love, I love listening to you tell stories about, you know, when you were young and, and some of those stories, like, so, so do you want to, do you want to talk a little bit about how your interest, where, where it came from for food and, and, um, at just like your, your pursuit of that. And I mean, you kind of talked about it already in your journey through there, but you know, something that you're really known for is using like local foods and indigenous foods. It says right on your, on your, um, websites from spruce tips <laughs> to rose hips, you know, so a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, I grew up, um, when I was really little, a baby, oh, I'm looking, there's a deer walking outside my window. Sorry. It's beautiful. Um, we moved to um, Besnard Lake and my dad worked for Prince Albert Popewood. So I grew up like right on the shores of Besnard Lake and we'd go to visit our friends on the trap line. And I remember, you know, being a fairly young, like four-year-old, three and a half, four-year-old and being able to drink tea with our friends in their, in their trap or in their, their little trapper's cabin and just smelling the different hides being dried and smoked and seeing what Damar had gathered from the the bush just behind the cabin and just I remember being fascinated by like can we eat that and she'd show me like these are rose hips you want to wait until there's been a first frost and they'll be even sweeter and then you can use them for this and that and this is fireweed and it blooms after the moose calf and I was just like I remember that stuff and I Whenever I see a little child and I tell them something or speak to them in any way, I try to remember that they remember. <laughs> so I think Damar Hastings, she was one of the first people that I remember hosting. And I think more than just cooking, I've always loved cooking when I've tried to make a living outside of cooking, I've always come back to it. But I think it's more feeding people and hosting them and trying to make sure they're okay in every way, not just that they have a plate of food in front of them and Jamar showed me that. So that was my first and then my mom was a very healthy cook. She was a nurse and we grew up eating lentils and whole wheat. I don't think I even knew what white bread was until I went to a friend's house. <laughs> so that's where I kind of got like my bannock has half recipe has half whole wheat flour in it because I was kind of brought up with, you know, try to eat as much whole foods, many whole food, foods as you can. And then um, when we were, when my sister was school age, we moved north of Orange and a mile down, about 10 kilometers north and a mile down a, a gravel road. Like how I mixed my metric and <laughs> imperial there, like a true 70s Canadian. Um, and we didn't have TV and we didn't have a phone until I was a teenager. So for something to do, I would go pick berries and cook and my mom would let me do anything I wanted as long as I cleaned up the mess. So that's, um, I was always just allowed to create with food. And I remember being just always just in awe that all these things are out there. And I think it wasn't until I always knew kind of in my heart that I needed to give thanks and be you know super appreciative for the ingredients that I harvested but it wasn't until I started working with Juana Skewan as a, a guest chef doing helping out with some feasts and culture days and later with the Hanwe dinner that I was really taught the proper protocols around harvesting and that changed everything it's just the way I approached gathering and and considering the plants as you know plant nations just like we're a nation and laying down laying down tobacco and how to do that so that was a huge part of my journey. And that was after I sold my restaurant and moved to Saskatoon to start Chef Jenny Cuisine, which was mostly catering. I remember when we first kind of met was uh, you were catering. You saved my life. 
Oh yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we had just finished not. doing a major dinner at Station Twenty West, and there were tons of dishes. And I had let everybody go home, and you took pity on me, and we visited, and you helped me in the dish pit till about eleven thirty. <laughs> I'll never forget you. <laughs> but that maybe wasn't what you were so going delicious. to say. That wasn't a very glamorous. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't that what it's all about, too? Like those people you meet, you know, the, the the event or the meal or the feast doesn't end when when the guests go home, does it? Exactly. It's it. You know, for me, it's fun to clean up with someone. You know, so often I think so often as mothers, we're just by ourselves in the kitchen these days. You know, and. And I, I really enjoyed that. I, I, I had learned to run a dish machine when I was a teenager and it was great to jump back in the dish pit and just keep company and, and, and get to know you a bit. And, and uh, I mean, the food was so good that it was an honor to help clean the dishes afterwards. I just wanted to know more about you. I was like, where does she come from? Where, where how did she learn to do all this? This is amazing. Yeah. I love that too, because I remember like I work or I, I don't work with, but I'm part of slow food Saskatoon and we've hosted I've done several dinners at Station 20 West in different places in the city. And one of the um, one of our members, Chef Michael Bole, is an instructor at South Poly, and he's a certified chef to cuisine. He's just an amazing chef and instructor. And after every event, he's in the dish pit and he's helping. And I think, isn't that cool that, you know, it's not just about how well you can plate something or how you know, your flavor profiles, it's about how humble you are and whether you're willing to kind of help out. Not that every chef should end, <laughs> should end up in the dish pit at the end of a meal, but you know what I mean? It's just kind of a cool barometer of kind of who's willing to do what. And, and that's where you have, sometimes have the most fun. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's enjoyable when you're, when you're doing anything together, right? It's, it's, it's all about the teamwork and the relationship, right? And yeah, that's, that's, for sure. that's something I, I feel like with you, you're, you're really good at building relationships, whether it's relationship with food or relationship with each other. So, yeah. Yeah. I feel like I'm really relationship rich and everywhere I've gone from, you know, I still have friends that had, you know, they had the table next to me at the, at the farmer's market in PA. And I still keep in touch with my customers from the restaurant in Birch Hills and different catering clients that I've had over the years have become dear friends. And I just think that's, it's such a rich tapestry and being able to be not only back of house, but because I kind of <laughs> a lot of times had to do it all. I didn't, I didn't hire staff usually unless I was doing a meal over a hundred people. So I was, you know, the front and the back and running the buffet line and, and doing all that. So I was really able to meet, I sound like it's over. It's not, I'm still doing things, but we've been so sequestered lately, but it's just been a beautiful way to meet people and grow relationships. Yeah, I mean, people like you. <laughs> <laughs> well, and and bonding over food. I mean, it's something like all of us need to eat, and so it's so lovely when you can when you can have sort of these these traditional foods that I mean, you you kind of do this fusion thing where you 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 put together new things with old things, and you you create some really lovely, like your Red River cinnamon buns or, or your, your rose hip, uh, you know, sauces and, and aioli. I, I don't know if I'm saying it right. I'm not, I'm not a very good. <laughs> not a very <laughs> <for me>. I <laughs> specialize <laughs> in saying things wrong. <laughs> I love it when you go out to eat and they correct your pronunciation. <laughs> it's bruschetta, not bruschetta. <laughs> exactly. You never do that. <laughs> <laughs> Although that leads to another thing, I think one thing I was trying to do at Wanna Scaler, and I think we'll probably incorporate more um, into the Hanwe dinners and kind of the immersive culinary experiences is working with the Cree speaking and Dakota speaking and maybe even midship speaking um, staff to really bring language into the dining experience. One time at one of the meals we were having um, smoked duck on a wild rice cracker that you would kind of dip into a fiddlehead soup and we're eating at the top of the Apimaha Valley looking down and Honey Constant one of the amazing interpreters and she's a uh, master's archaeology student too a duck flew over just as I was describing <laughs> what we were going to be eating and and his, Honey said sissy which is I'm probably saying that wrong but it was duck and it just kind of, you know, cemented that whole experience that, oh my goodness, this is what 
this is how we say this name when we're eating this food and it's just so important. So I think that, because when you think of another's, another language's, another culture's food, such as Italian, we didn't change the words so they were easier to say, did we? We didn't call lasagna like lala or anything like that. Like <laughs> we just learned it. And I think that's um, as indigenous cuisine, you know, comes, I want to say comes back, but comes more to the forefront and is enjoyed by more people. I hope language can be a big part of that. Absolutely. Such a good point. Yeah, I mean, I love that. Like, and I love the story about the duck. <laughs> <laughs> this is flying overhead. Perfect. We timing. were doing a, a, a Bannock demo video down in the in TP Village at Wanaskewin in March. And Honey was, I was doing the Bannock mixing on a table outside. It was a nice, unseasonably warm day. And then I handed the, the Bannock dough over to Honey to cook over the fire. And we were talking about Labrador tea or muskeg tea. And she gave the Cree word for that, which means bog water. And it's just, it was so descriptive, like way more descriptive than Labrador tea. So I think that's thats gonna be part of my journey is to kind of incorporate those. And even better to have the native speakers there to, to um, share that knowledge. Yeah, language is so important. And uh, I, mean, I, I mean, even if you think about place names like Saskatoon comes from Mrs. Guadaman, right? Which is mm -hmm. the Saskatoon berry and Saskatchewan comes from fast flowing river, right? And all of yeah. those things. Like we, 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 we can learn Cree words. We can learn how to say them. So. Yeah. yeah. Like I grew up about 60 kilometers south of Mississippi, and I didn't know I was this many years old when I found out that Mississippi means big water. I mean, it's just, it was something that was just in our, no, that's Mississippi. But when you think about it, it's just beautiful that we're, I mean, not as many place names and and um, lake names have retained their original names. And I think that part of reconciliation is going to be um, not just land back, but language back and renaming those places, what they actually were called. I would love for you to talk a little bit more about that, given that, you know, that when we're, we're recording this in June and it's National Indigenous Peoples Month and of course, you know that we just had the uh, the the anniversary of the residential school apology was earlier in June, mm -hmm. um, two thousand and eight. Was that that uh, residential school apology from the government? And of course, we've got the twenty first is National Indigenous Peoples Day. So, yeah, um, what what do people need to know in terms of the R word, the reconciliation word, and the truth that comes with it, and and kind of the 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 whole kind of indigenous peace, land back, language back, like all of that? Well, that's, it's a lot to unpack. And I've had a lot of conversations with family members in the last few weeks, um, really contemplative and, and sad and also wondering because as, you know, our Métis heritage, we don't know because our, it was hard enough to get people to talk about the fact that we were Métis because my grandma's kids were mostly light skinned and we don't know if her dad went to residential school. We don't, we don't know any of that and she's gone now. And, and you don't want to talk to someone and see their face look hurt and they're obviously upset. It's, it's, you don't want to make someone talk about that. So we didn't press things, but I think in terms of if anyone's out there saying, well, it wasn't us that did it, um, I'm not responsible for any of that. I think if you can, if you can go to an event and sit beside someone, talk to them, eat with them, I think you're probably going to change your mind. And I was blessed to have been raised in the North where there were um, kids from all over the world. It was kind of a... a <laughs> A bit of a global town because the the um, northern government, the DNS, had been situated there. So we had a we had Cree kids, we had a few Dene kids, we had Métis kids, we had families from Russia and Indonesia and Sri Lanka and India. And then when I moved 
to central Saskatchewan, I realized that, and obviously there was racism everywhere. It's not that there's no racism in the North, but there were people who had never been friends with an indigenous person, like say in a small farming community. And I'm not gonna say, of course, they're more likely to be racist. That's not automatically true. But if you don't have friends and you don't know people um, from that background, you might just join the common thinking of your area. I'm choosing my words very carefully because I don't want to, I don't want it to sound like everyone in small town Saskatchewan is racist or ignorant. That's like obviously not true, but um, I think breaking bread together, breaking bannock together and eating together and going to events where there's going to be people of different nationalities and especially Indigenous people, no, nothing bad can come of that. Does that make sense? Yes, that's exactly it. And, and, and I don't think anything bad unless someone like crashes it on purpose like that complete, can I swear on here? No. Oh, I probably won't. Not yet. But... <laughs> no, the person who, you know, came and ruined the pride celebration in Saskatoon a few mm. days ago, like, I don't know, I think, I hope that COVID and kind of this pause and some awareness building will, when that happens, I want it to be like a complete anomaly instead of, oh, that happened again this year. Like, that just breaks my heart. I have um, two spirit and um gay friends and family members and I just I think there's a lot of hate out there but I think it's becoming hopefully more help me out here you probably have some thoughts I think you know what I'm trying to say yeah distill it for me yeah, yeah. I mean it, it's it, it comes from that same place as racism where it's from fear and it's from ignorance and it's from greed and I think um I think, you know, there's enough space in the world for all of us, right? Like there's enough love in the world for all of us. We're all allowed to be who we are. And, mm -hmm. and, and so I think, I think when people come from that small mindedness, it's because they've been taught that. And I think, you know, that, that, um, you know, it's our responsibility to reach out with our hands open and say, look, come break bread with us. Just like you said, you know, um, get to know. And I think if people open their minds and their hearts just a little bit to their neighbors, right? And I think so. And when I had my restaurant, I was very, like, I was out front a lot and I would hear people talking. And if I heard people being racist or homophobic or, you know, saying disgusting things about women, I would just go and warn them once. And then the next time they were kicked out. And it was a hard thing to do. I had to do it, I think, three times in seven years. And it didn't go over well with a lot of people in the community because I was like well that's so-and-so's nephew yes <laughs> okay I get it but I think and then the cool part there's a happy part to this is that a lot of times they would come back and we'd have a talk and we'd talk about what had happened and why and I realized like sometimes they honestly did not even know that what they were saying was affecting me or affecting other diners they had no idea and it was a it was a really cool thing I think I only let back two people in out of the three that were that I had to ask to leave but it was really cool to see them kind of learn and these were not these were not young people like these were people that you'd think would be set in their ways and over you know definitely over the age of 50 so so there's there's always hope yeah, I believe that. And for us too, right? Like something I've said tonight might just tick someone right off and they might have to email me or phone me and say, you know what? Like that was a really irresponsible thing you said, or I don't know like how, it, and then I'll learn from that because we, we can do that. That's part of being human is that we can address our mistakes and apologize and, and not do it again, <laughs> <laughs> which is the key thing, right? <laughs> That's exactly. And I think that ties in nicely with the, with the failure of the residential school apology was that they were saying sorry for something that happened a long time ago and they keep doing it. Keep but it's still it. happening. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I think like, I, like it's interesting how we, we moved away from food, but when stuff like that happens and, and you hear people, you know, talking like that, or, you know, there's a, I lose my appetite 
and I, I, I don't just lose my appetite to eat, but I lose my appetite to cook as well. So um, that's another thing that I think is sometimes my food doesn't taste good. And I know why it's because I haven't cooked with the proper attitude. And that's, I always tell people your most important kitchen tool is your tasting spoon. But before that, you have to kind of set your intentions and your mind and your heart right before you feed people, because it's such a responsibility. You're preparing things that go in their mouth and in their body, right? Yeah, you're in It's such a them. huge, you are, yeah. It's such a huge responsibility. Yeah, it is. Well, we only have like maybe a couple of minutes left, but um, a little bit. Tell more. me a joke. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I think um, I ended think, on a high note. <laughs> that's right. I think you've really nailed it, though, in terms of nourishing nourishing people, and that like you can taste when food is made with love and good intention. You can honestly taste that. I know you can. Hey, yeah. Bannock Express. <laughs> <laughs> a little plug there. Go get your Bannock burgers. <laughs> no, but you really can when um, people like Rachel or um, you know just. So many chefs in Saskatoon and restaurants in Saskatoon, they're using amazing local ingredients and you can taste that they're, they're putting that food out there, not because they're making a million dollars or they're getting their name splashed all over food magazines it's because they truly want to feed us. And I think that's, it's, it's just amazing. I'm happy to be part of that, that culture and that tennis profession. What has been one of your, one of your favorite dishes that you've, that you've made, like something like, cause you've made so many cool things and so many unusual um, ingredients that you've put together. And I remember tasting your, um, your submission and photographing it out at Wanuskewin last year for, the, for one of the competitions, one of the many chef competitions that you've been in and placed in and all of that. So what, what, is there something that really stands out as one of your favorite dishes that you've put together? I think that one is probably one of my favorite dishes because it was so closely tied to place and to history. So the, that dish in question was a bison tenderloin and we seared it in a rose hip butter, rose hip kind of a garlic butter. We topped it with chanterelles from Boreal Heartland and Lorange kind of fried in, in bison fat and sage. And then the whole thing was sitting on top of a nettle puree and the nettle we harvested from right under the bison jump. So that it kind of went together with time and place and flavors and, and the vitamin K in the nettle really helps you absorb the iron in the meat. So it wasn't just a, you know, Tech, we weren't just trying to be get technical points for our dish or you know the color and everything it was actually had a purpose so I think that that was probably my favorite my other favorite dish was a, another competition I dish I did I called it Lee Salé which is Machif for the sun and I used about seven different members of the sunflower family to create a vegan dish that kind of reflect reflects my Meiji heritage and that some members of that plant family come from Europe like the dandelion and endive and some are native to North America, like um, chamomile and sun chokes and sunflowers. And I actually based the plating of it on a photo that I saw, or sorry, a painting that I saw by the beautiful artist, Leah Dorian. So that one's kind of special to me because it had a story and it, it kind of wove together kind of European and, and indigenous cultures. I love that. But basically, I like any dish that turns out. <laughs> well, I'm always well, surprised and I've thrilled and just so grateful. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen any of your dishes that haven't turned out. So oh, know. they're they're there. <laughs> <laughs> My family just has to eat them. <laughs> or the, the kitchen staff. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time. That's flown by, but um to all our relations and believe me we are all related so act like you've got relations kishi marcy to our relative tonight uh chef jenny lassard and you can find out more at jennylassard.com um this is auntie andy signing out from homelands originally produced on cfcr community radio 90.5 fm in saskatoon homelands of the metis and treaty six territory cfcr.ca you can find excellent programming on indian cowboy podcasting Follow us on Twitter at Métis Homelands or email at MétisHomelands at gmail.com. This episode will also be viewable on our YouTube channel, Homelands, so subscribe today. Marcy, thank you for listening. And Akoshi, Kawapa, Matina, Mina. That's all. We'll see you later. <laughs>